Well, thank you, Tom. Um, the sign up here is being held up by Vel Velcro. And if I remember right, that was a product of the space program. Do I remember that correctly? So right there, we'll see if the technology holds any longer. Uh, well, I'm thrilled to be able to do this. Jim Bridenstine is a native of Michigan, but he came to Texas to study at Rice University, and then he went on to um, Cornell to do his MBA. He's a naval aviator and a fighter pilot. NASA thought having pilot training was so important when they started the uh, Mercury program that all the Mercury astronauts had to be test pilots. They had to have that kind of experience. Jim later moved to Oklahoma, where he became an executive director of the Tulsa Air and Space Museum and Planetarium and volunteered for the Oklahoma Air National Guard. Uh, Bridenstine ran for Congress from Oklahoma for the first time in 2012 and won. He served on the House Armed Services Committee and the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. President Trump nominated him to be the 13th. <laughs> Hopefully it worked better in the Apollo. <laughs> President Trump nominated him to be the 13th Administrator of NASA, and the Senate confirmed him in April of 2018. The President has thrown down the gauntlet. He wants, to be re, he wants to re energize the NASA and have it become much more aggressive, pers pursuing manned space flight once again, aiming for the moon and then Mars. The quest pro poses challenges, but it also poses opportunities. A re recent article in the Smithsonian Magazine says that uh, uh, the, need, the need for new technology, such as microprocessors, became mankind's primary benefits from our first drive to the moon. The renewed effort could provide even more and greater engineering miracles. But we aren't just pioneering space or re-pioneering space. NASA is pioneering a new approach to space exploration that includes the private sector. Numerous private sector companies are taking the lead in developing ways and the tools we need to travel in space. And NASA will be one of their primary customers. But there is more than one dark side to the moon. The President recognizes that space also poses risk. Uh, any country that dominates space could potentially dominate Earth. So he is pro proposing a space force to begin considering possible challenges. Jim has big tasks ahead of him, and now here he is to tell us how he's going to tackle those tasks. Jim? Well, thank you so much for that great introduction. It's an honor to be here. Um, and of course, there's so many friends here from uh, times past. Uh, Raphael Cruz, it's great to be with you as always. Um, I spent a bit of time uh, with um, Raphael Cruz when we were campaigning for his son. And uh, I have great memories of that. And it was always, uh, always a pleasure to be with you on the road. Um, I would also say, uh, thank you for the introduction about, um, you know, being from Michigan, but I will say that when I was three, my parents moved me to Arlington, Texas, and I spent uh, my formative years here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area growing up in Arlington, Texas. I went to Arlington Martin. Any Arlington Martin High School folks here? Well, they didn't do the right thing then, did they? Um, but I will also say I see a number of tables back here at the University of Texas at Arlington. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and I can also say, um, you know, if it wasn't for the University of Texas at Arlington, I probably would not be the NASA administrator right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I was uh, the summer after my fifth grade year, I was in fifth grade, summer after my fifth grade year, my mom signed me up to participate in a camp that was at the University of Texas at Arlington, and this camp was the, the utilization of a wind tunnel. So we actually got to put different, um, different airfoils in the wind tunnel and see what creates lift and drag and change the camber of the wing and change you know, the shape of the wing and all of these different things. And from that moment forward, I knew that I knew that I knew that I wanted to be a pilot. Um, and of course, that led eventually, um, when I was in high school, my parents moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
Uh, when I went to college, I went back to Rice University here, here in Texas. Um, and I want to be clear, in 1994, Rice beat the University of Texas in football. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I know that I just became very unpopular. I know that. But I'll tell you, when Rice beats Texas in football, it makes me popular in Oklahoma, which I represented in the House of Representatives. So I get that. Um, so here's the thing. Um, University of Texas at Arlington, Arlington has been a, just a big part of my life. Uh, I, I swam in high school and spent a lot of hours going back and forth in that little pool at the University of Texas at Arlington. And it, it, interestingly, my memories of this building that we're in right now, I'm going to tell you some memories. If I'm going down memory lane. Is that all right? Can I do that for a second? Let me go, here's the thing. Um, when my, my mom, I remember my mom had a birthday, and my dad wanted to do something special. And one of the things he did is he took us for a weekend to what was, at the time, the Lowe's Anatole. And the reason that was so important is because the Lowe's Anatole in the 1980s, it was new. And Ronald Reagan stayed here. I mean, what could be better than going to the hotel that Ronald Reagan stayed in? And that was my dad's perspective, of course. And he said, we're going to go spend the weekend at the Lowe's Anatole for my for my, my mom's birthday at the time, and now it's, of course, the Hilton, is that right? The Hilton Anatole. Um, but I will also say I have memories of um, coming here in 1984. My dad took us to the Republican National Convention, which was in Dallas. Ronald Reagan was running for re-election. Um, and, you know, we didn't know that you couldn't just walk in or get tickets there. Uh, we got rejected, and we had to watch in a hotel. And I don't remember which hotel it was. Um, I think it w I think I think it might have been this one, as a matter of fact. Um, and watching Ronald, and I remember being in a room like this with all these chairs, and they had a big screen, and and Ronald Reagan was speaking, and every time he said a line, everybody would stand up and start clapping. And I remember thinking, wait a second, that's happening down the road. He can't even hear you. Why are you clapping? <laughs> um, I was in fourth grade at the time, uh, but anyway, great memories here, and thank you so much for inviting me. And and it's it's an honor and a pleasure to get an opportunity to talk to you about what NASA is up to and the policy implications of what NASA is up to. That's the key, Institute for Policy Innovation. And what NASA does when it comes to national policy is critically important. And I think sometimes it gets missed, but I want to make sure that I communicate to you some of the things throughout history and where we're going in the future and how what NASA does is critical for national policy. I'm going to take you back in time. You guys probably all watched, I know Mark did, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And we saw millions of people all across the world celebrating with us on July 20th, uh, the, the 50, 50th anniversary of the 1969 moon landing. Hundreds of thousands of people, over 500,000 people came to the, the Washington Mall in, in Washington, D.C., celebrating, in fact, something positive. And as a former member of Congress, I can tell you I've seen lots of people on the mall, and they're generally not happy. In this case, in this case, we had 500,000 people, and, and, and they were very diverse, and they had all different political affiliations, but they were all celebrating that stunning achievement in the history of humanity when Americans first stepped foot on another world, and it was led by the United States of America. Now, that was amazing. But before Apollo 11, there was an event called Apollo 8. And Apollo 8, in my view, was probably the most stunning mission in history. And I, I know we have, t tell me your name, sir. Scott Nickel, Dr. Scott Nickel, um, the nephew of Jim Lovell, is that right? Um, Jim Lovell, of course, was the commander of Apollo 8. I want to I wanna share for a second why Apollo 8 was so important. In fact, you've got to go back to Apollo 6. Apollo 6 was a test flight for a lot of the elements that would be involved in sending humans to the moon, but it was just an, an orbit around the Earth on Apollo 6. The Saturn rocket, the command module, the crew module, all of these things had to come together and be tested. And we did that on Apollo 6 around the Earth. Here's the problem. The second stage of the Saturn V rocket, five engines, two of them failed on that second stage. The single engine that was for the command module, that engine, that if you're going to go to the moon, it has to be relit over and over and over again. You have to light it for translunar injection. You have to, to light it to, 
uh, to, to go into low lunar orbit. You have to relight it to, to make your orbit circular. And then, of course, you have to leave the moon by firing that single engine. You have to be able to relight that engine over and over and over again for a lunar mission. And when we were testing it in orbit around the Earth on Apollo 6, it wouldn't reignite even once. It failed. We could not achieve the velocity necessary to test the heat shield on the crew module. And, and so when it came back, we had all kinds of unanswered questions. This was in April, April of 1968. It was a mission failure. In fact, the rocket did what we call pogo. It shaked so bad that parts of the rocket itself fell off. And when it got done, and, they came, and it was uncrewed, it was an uncrewed mission, but when it was over, everybody was like, wow, this is going to set us back years. Something important happened the day after that came home. We had intelligence. The Soviet Union was going to be around the moon with a free return trajectory. In other words, they were going to go straight out around the moon, just like they did in Apollo 13, as a matter of fact, another Jim Lovell mission. Uh, a free return trajectory around the moon, uh, and they were going to do it by the end of 1968. The intelligence comes in, and NASA has to make a decision. What do we do? And they said, well, we're going to go faster than we've ever gone before. They took that moon lander, the lunar lander, and they dropped it because it was taking too long to develop. And they said, by the end of this year, we're going to be around the moon. A lot of decisions had to get made, but we made the decision to move faster, and we skipped a couple of missions, and by Apollo 8, which was Christmas Eve, 1968, just, what, eight months, Christmas Eve, 1968, we had this crew in orbit around the moon. The decision to go, by the way, was not just a decision about beating the Russians or the Soviets at the time. The decision was this. If something goes wrong, like what happened on Apollo 6, it will... Imagine this, Christmas Eve, having astronauts stranded at the moon. It would destroy Christmas. And yeah, that, that might sound funny today, but back then, that's a very serious implication when you're, in fact, uh, you know, a president trying to make a decision, do we go or not go? And of course, NASA said, we can do this. We can make this happen. And, and, and on Christmas Eve, 1968, our astronauts made it to the moon. I want to read to you for a second. When they, were, when they were on the moon on Christmas Eve, they made a broadcast. And in that broadcast, one out of every four, and I, I'm not checking my mail, just so you know. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to read to you what they said. 1968, Christmas Eve, the entire world is watching. One out of every four people on the planet either heard or saw this broadcast. That's amazing reach in 1968. And this is what they said. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And, the God, and God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called these seas. And God saw that it was good. And then they wished everybody good luck and Merry Christmas before signing off. Here's the important thing about that message. Christmas Eve, 1968. Nobody in the United States government told them what to say. But one by one, our three astronauts went through Genesis 1-1 through 1-10.
reading it. Here's what they were told by NASA. Say something profound. <laughs> well, that's pretty profound, my friends. And what's even more profound is at the time, when you consider what we were up against, this contest of ideas between the United States of America and the Soviet Union, this great contest of political prowess, great contest of economic prowess, great contest of, in fact, technological prowess. This was the moment that everybody had been working towards, 400,000 people trying to accomplish this mission, plus all of the taxpayer dollars across the country. And here in this one moment in time, when everybody on the planet was watching, that was their message to the world. And you know what? There were tens of millions of people behind the Iron Curtain where Christmas was illegal that heard that message. That's national policy at its best. And nobody told those astronauts what to say. But if they were going to communicate to people that did not have the freedoms we enjoy here in the United States, they had a message they wanted to share. I'm sorry. They had a message they wanted to share, and they shared it. You have a couple of minutes when you can tell the whole world what's unique about the United States of America. How do you do that? Well, let's tell them about the beginning. That's national policy at its best. Congress. Congress shall make no law with respect to the establishment of religion, nor a prohibition on the free exercise thereof. It is the First Amendment enshrined in the Constitution. And those three gentlemen exercised it, and our nation was made better for it. And there are people. <laughs> okay, so there's so much more to say. And I'm going to move on because you guys want to hear about what we're doing today and what we're doing in the future. But there's another element here that I think is important. Because we, have, we just celebrated the anniversary of Apollo 11. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, what was the first, the first thing that was done on the surface of the moon? Some people know. Buzz Aldrin took communion on the surface of the moon. After, yeah, some people are shocked. He took communion. After this event, of course, the United States government was sued. Um, NASA said, hey, we don't want to broadcast anything, so if you want to take communion. He asked everybody from the moon, in a live broadcast from the surface of the moon, he asked everybody for a moment of silence to recognize the, you know, the, the gravity of this situation. I don't think he used the word gravity, but you understand what I'm saying. And before he took communion, and he didn't do it on the air, but before he took communion, he read uh, John 15, verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Of course, those are the words of Jesus in John 15. And interestingly, when they were flying home, uh, Buzz Aldrin did something else. Um, he made a, real quick, i got to pull it up here. So this is what Buzz Aldrin said, and he keyed the mic this time and broadcast it. Oh, I can't get a signal in here. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and that the son of man that thou vid visiteth him? That was, uh, that was what Buzz Aldrin read on the way back from the moon. Again, um, these, these were folks that were exercising their First Amendment, and the whole world was watching. You can imagine Apollo 11. One out of four in Apollo 8. How many in Apollo 11? Everybody on the planet. And if you weren't there to see it at the time, everybody saw it afterwards. Um, and Buzz, Buzz Aldrin had those things to say. That's national policy in a way 
that represents what's good about the United States of America, the First Amendment being uh, brought forward in a way that is magnificent. Um, but I will also say that as we go forward, these elements of national power, that's, that's information power. In national security, we talk about dime, national policy, information power, um, is a big piece of what in national security we call dime. There's a number of elements of national power. We are all familiar with military power. The big M in dime is the military. But that's not what NASA does. We don't do military power. We do soft power. In fact, we do diplomacy. When you think about dime, what does the acronym stand for? D is for diplomacy. I is for information. And when we go forward, we think about just November of last year, we landed InSight, a robot, on Mars. It's the eighth time in human history that we have ever been able to land on Mars. And there's only one country that's ever done it. It's the United States of America. And eight times. Yeah, you can clap for that. I'm <laughs> Others have tried, but only the United States has accomplished it. And this time when we did it in November of last year, we did it with, in fact, international partners. We had science experiments on the InSight lander from, uh, from France and from Germany, and we've got scientists in Poland and Spain that will be working on this. But here's what's magnificent. 50 years after Apollo, when we landed InSight on Mars, it was on the cover of every newspaper worldwide. Why is that important? Because it changes the perceptions of young people all over the world who are hearing bad things about the United States of America, and it lets them know, wait a second, maybe the United States can do amazing things, and maybe we should be a part of it. It changes the perceptions of young people towards the United States of America. That's the information power that NASA uniquely brings to the United States government. When we landed InSight on Mars, it was on the cover of every newspaper worldwide. One newspaper, newspaper in particular caught my attention, and I don't remember what it was called, but it was the newspaper in Tehran. And the subtitle of the newspaper was The Hardline Newspaper of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Now, for the young people around, though they don't say nice things about the United States of America. But I can tell you in this article, they talked about what we had just accomplished, and the last paragraph, in fact, talked about the international partners that were with us. That's information power from landing a robot on the surface of Mars. That only NASA can deliver that kind of good news story with an American flag attached to it and have people celebrate it all over the world, regardless of what might be going on in those countries. That's information power. Now, when we think about the D, diplomacy, we think about the International Space Station. We now have 15 nations that are operating the International Space Station together, including one of them is now Russia. After the Apollo program, landing on the moon six times with 12 humans walking on the surface of the moon, it was determined that the United States and, and the Soviet Union at the time, 19 72, it was determined that we would collaborate on what, ca what came next. The United States and the Soviet Union, height of the Cold War, we're going to collaborate on what comes next. We put together a program, we called it Shuttle, or I'm sorry, at the time it was Apollo Soyuz. And it was a capsule that used um, elements of the Apollo program and elements of the Soyuz program. They were together, it was a space station, and of course our astronauts and their cosmonauts lived for a period of time together on the Apollo Soyuz. Interestingly, if you go to Russia, they call it the Soyuz Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, that is, again, an element of national power that is diplomacy. It's a channel of communication that didn't exist before, but now it exists to make sure that there is no miscalculation that leads us to something catastrophic. But at the end, here's the other thing. After Apollo Soyuz, we had the shuttle program with the Mir space station. So the collaboration continued with the shuttle Mir, and now we have the International Space Station where you've got the United States of America and Russia with our astronauts and cosmonauts living and working together in space for now almost 20 years. That's an amazing tool of diplomacy. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's not a lot of 
love lost terrestrially between the two countries. But, but we have a situation where we can actually bridge the gap with, with, with the space station. I will also say that we have had astronauts, and so now it's 15 nations, Russia, the United States, and we've got the European Space Agency, Canada, Japan, European Space Agency has 11. We've got 15 nations that are operating the ISS, and we've had astronauts from 18 different countries on the International Space Station, and we've had experiments from 103 different countries on the International Space Station. Again, we're changing the perceptions of people all over the world towards this very unique experiment we call the United States of America, a very, very positive development for our country. So I've talked about diplomatic power, talked about information power. There's the military power, which is a really big M, and everybody is aware of that, but NASA doesn't play there. We do, we do play there in some ways when you talk about technology and how NASA technology has national security implications and national security technology has exploration implications. I mean, we were talking earlier about Apollo. Um, you, go back to, um, you go back to Mercury. Uh, Alan Shepard launched on an ICBM, the first person, the first American, or they would say the first free man in space, launched on an ICBM of all things, which is kind of interesting. So there is an element where NASA technology can be used for national security and vice versa. But then the big E, and I heard conservatism, I heard libertarian, I heard these kind of words, I know that this might be that kind of think tank, Institute for Policy and for in, in Innovation. What is the E? The economy. There's economic power that the United States again uniquely has. And when we talk about the future and where we are today and where we are going, the economic power cannot be dismissed. And I, uh, earlier today, somebody came up to me and, and asked me, how are you going to pay for this? How are you going to pay for this? Let me talk for a second about what this economic power is all about. Uh, I know there's TV cameras here. Some people are going to maybe watch this online. I see we're also recording it. If you're watching it online, you might be watching it via internet broadband from space, which is the only way you're going to get the internet in rural parts of the United States of America these days. You might be watching it on DirecTV or Dish Network, which again is space-based communications that is uniquely necessary for remote parts of the country. Um, but it's not just about communication. We talk about navigation, GPS. GPS is required for how we, maybe some of you navigated here with GPS today. Uh, and in fact, um, we talk about not just the GPS for navigation, but also timing, the timing signal of GPS. People should be aware, and I keep talking about it, but every banking transaction in the United States of America is dependent on a timing signal from GPS. No GPS, no banking. That's a big deal. No banking, no milk in the grocery store within days. That's a problem. But it's not just timing signal for banking, it's also the regulation of flows of electricity on terrestrial wireless networks, depending on a t dependent on a timing signal from GPS. No GPS, no terrestrial wireless network. Your grid, the power grid, dependent on a timing signal from GPS, no GPS, the power grid will not function. We gotta get these things corrected. But here's the thing, these threats alone have encouraged China specifically to call space the American Achilles heel. And I can tell you that President Trump and Vice President Pence will not allow space to be the American Achilles heel for the United States of America. But it goes beyond that. The way we produce food, the way we produce energy, critically important to the state of Texas, the way we produce energy, dependent on state, on space, in a way that we can do it cleanly. If there's a methane leak or some other kind of natural gas leak that is a, that, that is a, a, um, a greenhouse gas, we can detect it early and that's good for the oil companies. Why? Because then they don't get fined by the EPA and they like that. NASA has the technology to make sure that, the, and not just NASA, but eventually commercial companies will have the technology to make sure that we are detecting that early. The way we do disaster relief and national security, all of these things conspire to say that space is necessary for the American way of life. So the E piece, economics, 
we're talking about commercially a multiple hundred billion. It's over $400 billion today for the United States of America, and it's, good, it's, it's an export. We talk about aeronautics and space. I know two, you know, when you talk about Texas, two critically important uh, industries for the state of Texas, these are exports for the United States of America on net. That's important. Why is that? Because, you know, you hear my boss, the president, you hear him talk about the trade deficit a lot. You hear him talk about the balance of payments. Well, here we have something that actually is positive in our favor where we're exporting more than we're importing. That's a positive thing. We've got to make sure that we keep that. Um, but all of these technologies, all these capabilities, born from this little agency that gets less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. Less than half of 1%. Less than half of 1% of the federal budget. That's, so the return on investment is spectacular. There is no investment that returns nearly as much. When we think about the future, I, and I, I'm sure people have their ideas, but, um, <laughs> but then let's, let's, let's drill down for a second here. We think about the International Space Station and the future of low Earth orbit specifically. Crude flight. You know, we retired the shuttles back in 2011. The president at the time decided also to cancel the replacement to the shuttle. It was called Constellation. That put the United States of America in a place where we could not continue to be preeminent. That was not good policy in my view. President Trump has a different idea. He wants America to be at the forefront to lead and to move further ahead, not just maintain the lead that we currently have. And so we're doing that. Um, but how do we do that in low Earth orbit? Here's how. I heard people talk about commercial activities. Right now on the International Space Station, we are resupplying it, not by purchasing, owning, and operating rockets and hardware, but by buying services from a very robust commercial marketplace that NASA developed. Public-private partnerships have now enabled these companies to stand on their own, and they are now selling their capabilities all around the world for an export to the United States of America. NASA is one customer of many customers. We have numerous providers that are competing on cost and innovation, driving down the cost, increasing the access, and benefiting the balance of payments for the United States of America. That's just for resupplying the International Space Station. Within a year, we will be sending crew to the International Space Station in the same way where instead of us purchasing, owning, and operating the hardware, we are going to be buying it as a service from, again, a robust commercial marketplace for sending humans to low Earth orbit that was uniquely developed by NASA. So that here we have, again, an ability for private companies to go get customers that are not NASA. And when I say NASA, I mean you, because it's your money. They're going to get customers that are private, that are commercial in nature, driving down costs and increasing access to low Earth orbit. And by the way, we also have numerous providers that are competing for that, for that industry. They're competing on cost and innovation. Another d benefit to you as the American taxpayer. And when we think about the future of habitation itself, in other words, space stations, we are using the International Space Station right now for a very important purpose. And that is to develop the markets and capabilities so that we will have sustainable human life in orbit that, can, that, that, is, that is designed specifically for commercial activities that will transform lives on Earth. Again, it would be driven commercially. So we have partnerships right now where we're developing capability for commercial habitation, where, and, 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 and of course the experiments we're doing on the International Space Station, two lines of effort that are important. One is industrialized biomedicine. A lot of people are familiar with the pharmaceuticals that, are, that you can compound in a microgravity environment that you cannot develop in the gravity well of Earth. That's transformational. A lot of people might be familiar with the fact that right now on the International Space Station, we are proving that you can print using adult stem cells you can print human organs, human tissue, in three dimensions. Y if you try to do it on Earth, it all, the gravity well, it makes the tissue flat. But in a microgravity environment, you can do it. And you don't have to have scaffolding in the tissue the way you would have to do it on Earth, which is very damaging and problematic. That could have absolutely huge implications for life on Earth. We're, we're showing that in a microgravity environment, the way you can do materials in a microgravity environment we can create 
retinas, retinal implants for your eye that you cannot create in the gravity well of Earth. But in a microgravity environment, you can create a retina that can make it such that somebody who has certain types of macular degeneration, they will get their eyesight back. And we can, we can create that in a microgravity environment in a way that you cannot do it on Earth. So I, I, think, I think it's very serious that we could, within three to seven years, find some amazing breakthroughs that will result in markets in low Earth orbit, not just for habitation, but for development of, uh, of technology that will, that will transform lives on Earth. And that's what we're using the International Space Station for. And of course, after that, um, there's material sciences on the International Space Station. And we're, we're using it to advance things like fiber optics that are going to transform how we do communications here on Earth. We can create fiber optics in a very pristine way. So know this. We're commercializing low Earth orbit for a purpose. So that we can take the resources that you give us and go to the moon and on to Mars. Because there's going to be markets that develop there as well. And we want to make sure that the United States of America is leading that effort. I know I'm getting the hook. Do you mind if I play a video real quick? Yeah, sure. It's a couple minutes. Yeah, sure. And then we'll do quest questions. Yeah, sure. Here you go. So when we think about what happens next, when we think about what happens next, we're going to the moon. We're going sustainably. This is in the President's Space Policy Directive 1. He says, go to the moon, go sustainably, go with commercial partners, go with international partners, utilize the resources of the moon, hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the south pole of the moon. Water ice represents life support. It's air to breathe. It's water to drink. It's also rocket fuel. Hydrogen and oxygen is the same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles. It's the same rocket fuel that will power the biggest rocket ever built, the SLS, that's going to take our astronauts back to the moon. But it's available in hundreds of, hundreds of millions of tons. And then we're going to take what we learn at the moon. How do we live and work for long periods of time? And we're going to go to Mars. 